Good evening, everyone. Welcome. I call the meeting of the Water Utility Authority for September 25th. 2019 to order. Vice President Pena and Member Jones are excused and all the other members are present. Uh, we're going to begin with a moment of silence and the Pledge of Allegiance led by uh, Councillor Ken Sanchez. Thank you, Councillor Sanchez. Uh, go next to item three, which is the approval of minutes. I move uh, to approve August 21st, 2019 minutes. Second. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The motion carries. Uh, there are no proclamations or awards. That takes us next to public comment. Uh, Mrs. Carrion, how many folks do we have signed up to speak? We have two speakers. Okay. So um, each speaker will have three minutes to speak with a um, warning bill at two, two, and, two and a half minutes. Uh, so if you please call the first speaker. Geraldine Amato, followed by Elaine Hebert. Okay. Welcome. <laughs> Good evening. I wish to share with you what I have learned long after I've been out of school. Despite our worship of the federal flag here at these meetings, the Republic does not exist. I have learned that the Republic existed only in its incubation stage for three years, and then the federal constitution was passed. Over the protests of such people as Patrick Henry, Richard Henry Lee, and some of the original declarers of independence from the tyranny of Great Britain. We are not taught this in school. We're under a private commercial jurisdiction today, much like what the original 13 colonies were under at the time of the frustration of the American, the English Americans uh, established here to run the colonies, the business establishment of the British king. So today the municipal corporations and all these incorporated bodies are actually agents of the corporate state. And if you look at the agenda, most of it's contract legal enactments. Contract law, they call it. It's not really law of the republic. It has to do with the private commercial jurisdiction, the, they call it the US, the Federal Uniform Commercial Code, upon which all state statutes are formed. 
We don't study this anywhere in the public schools, not even in so-called law school. I read for a blind law student in the 1980s. They did not even read the federal constitution. They read what they call case law, which are, de which are the decrees of the aristocrats on the higher courts, the higher federal courts, because the British bench and bar was established here by the first federal Congress. Recently I heard on so-called public radio, KUNM, where a, a author was discussing the fact that when the constitutional convention was called, before all this electronic transmission of information and communications was established, they did it surreptitiously. They did not want to alarm too many of the Americans under the jurisdiction of the Articles of Confederation that this constitutional conventions were being called. But Patrick Henry's speeches, he was an orator, not a writer, are still recorded in a congressional record. His speeches before the Virginia Constitutional Convention in Virginia, they are prophetic. There's two speeches from June of 1787. If you read those, you will comprehend better where we are today than what you're learning today at the university level, the college level, and the public school network. Our educational system is controlled not by the good people of this nation, but by the establishment overlords who work with the international financiers. And our monetary system today and all our resources, including our water resources, are commercialized. They're not under the control of the good people. The control of those who are watching their bottom line and they destroy everything they touch. They're about aggrandizing power and wealth this side of heaven and they don't give a damn what happens on the other side. At least they don't, they don't, they're not thinking about it. We need to think about it and we need to do something about it. So Thank I pray you. that enough people will understand that we're getting to a serious situation in this nation. Thank you. Any questions? Elaine Hebbard is our last Thank speaker. You. Welcome. Thanks. <clears throat> my name is Elaine Hebbard. I'd like to make two points and two recommendations in my three minutes. Clearly, I will have left out a bunch of details. Item, um, agenda item 7A, amending the CIP funds, underscores the idea why an inspector general could be very useful. As the, Thanks. I'm sorry. As, as the cover memo says, the FY20 capital program appropriates about $88.3 million, 68.3. It further says that the FY19 carryover amounts to 53, 55.3, almost just $13 million less. So that doesn't sound like just a little adjustment to me. So I looked at the breakdown of the unobligated funds <clears throat> and the miscellaneous adjustments and found a couple of interesting things. One, under special projects, the category of miscellaneous grew from 2.7 million to 21.1 million. Not really a small adjustment, that's about a third of the new increase. So I guess the administration building is costing more than it had been anticipated, but there's never been a presentation on that. Another jump was for water 2120 projects, which went from 300,000 to 2.5 million. Um, and so, it would be nice to know which projects were being funded for that kind of money. My recommendation to this board that you need assistance in wading through the various things that you are presented. The city council has, a, um, has its own services that review things and when the water utility was under the city council, the council actually looked at all of those numbers. My other comment is about the water report and the compliance report and very quickly, um, Again, you get the no news that we're using less water, great, but it doesn't break down between the surface water and groundwater. That's important because in the second presentation that I mentioned, the compliance, if you look at slide 13, it talks about the water levels being above that 50 foot below pre-development level from 2020 to 2060. That's not gonna be possible unless much more pumping is reduced so that you don't have the ongoing depletions and yet you can re reuse your water. So my suggestion there is to create a goal for resiliency and include in that the category of groundwater pumping and recycling so you set met metrics so that you can attain those, much like the conservation plan. Thank you. Thank you. That is public comment. 
So um, it's item six, announcements, communications. The next scheduled meeting of this board is for October 23rd, um, 5 p.m. in these chambers. Go to next to item seven. This is the first reading of introduction of legislation, 7A. Uh, this is uh, R1923, amending funds for the capital implementation program of the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility Authority for the fiscal year 2020. Mr. Albert. Uh, Madam Chairman, members of the board, this is this a, um, a resolution to move unobligated appropriations that we have not spent the money on that has been approved by this board uh, prior to 2020 to move those to fiscal year 2020 so we can spend those. That is required by the Department of Finance and Administrative Services from the state of New Mexico. What we'll probably do in the future is write administrative instruction saying that every year we'll move those unobligated appropriations for to the next fiscal year and then share that with the Department of Finance and Administrative Services. But for this year, we need to do a resolution to do that. And this is the resolution to um, carry out that very task. And I stand for any questions. Are there any questions? All right, this is the first reading, so we won't be um, acting on it. Thank you. Well, next to the consent agenda. There are several items on the consent agenda. It's I don't know if anybody has any questions or just move approval. Move approval of the consent agenda. Second. There's a motion and a second to approve approval of the consent agenda. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The motion carries. Go next to item nine, which is approvals. 9A, R 1919, which is authorizing agreement with this authority and the Pueblo Cerros Homeowners Association to allow private sanitary sewer service connection. Chris Cadena. Hello, Welcome. Madam Chair, members of the board. This is a development agreement for an existing 100-unit condominium complex located in the village of Corrales. Currently, they're getting water via an on-site private well and sanitary sewer service via an on-site private wastewater treatment plant. They're coming to the Water Authority to get sewer service because that wastewater treatment plant is deteriorating, and the New Mexico Environment Department isn't willing to renew their, their permit. So, Pueblo Service is only seeking sewer service, and they're gonna get sewer service with the proposed private sewer force main that would go through a couple uh, roadways within the city of Albuquerque. The entire line would be solely owned and maintained by Pueblo Los Cerros, and they would be required to pay the utility expansion charges for the sewer. Okay, and this utility expansion showers as well, uh, um, charges as well as the infrastructure? Correct, yes, okay. it would all be developer funded. Okay. Do you have any questions about this item? Approval. So motion and a second to approve 9A. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The motion carries. Takes us next to, buy, to 9B. R1920, authorizing this utility to submit an application for funding to the Water Trust Board for Advanced Meter Infrastructure Project Phase 5. Ms. Anderson? Yes, I am. Um Madam Chair, members of the board, this is an uh, requesting authorization to submit a, an application for water trust board funding for um, continued. Oh, okay. Is that better? Oh, okay. So this is an author is this is a requesting authorization for the water authority to submit an application to the water trust board for funding for um, continuation of it's a phase five of the advanced meter infrastructure project um okay all right this requires our approval, approval. Yes. for for request for that okay i move approval of 9b second okay. motion and a second for approval of 9b all those in favor say aye aye all opposed say no the motion carries takes us to 9c authorizing this authority to submit an application for funding to the bureau of reclamation for water smart grant Catherine Uhas, this is for aquifer, aquifer storage and recovery uh, for our an aqua, aquifer storage and recovery project. Ms. Uh, Uhas, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, tonight, I am requesting your approval to apply for a WaterSmart grant to the Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, this grant would have a maximum uh, uh, award of seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, and the match is fifty percent. So the maximum that we would be obligated to fund would be seven hundred fifty thousand dollars from the Capital Improvement Fund for Water Twenty One Twenty. Okay, and this is we have a we do have an aquifer storage and recovery project now. So how does this? What is this? For exactly. Uh, Madam Chair, this is actually a, a new type of project that we're looking at, which would be small infiltration ponds. 
Uh, and we're looking at developing a series of projects with these infiltration ponds that we could actually put in neighborhoods um, as sort of a neighborhood enhancement. They'd actually be like a little park. At least that's our vision of them. They'd have plantings. We'd put a walking path around them. So they'd be an educational opportunity as well as infiltrating water into the aquifer. So it's kind of a giving back and also infiltration project. So these are like little reservoirs or, no, no they wouldn't be, because they, they wouldn't be, they'd be, dr I was like, are they drainage ponds? Um, so it kind of sounds like they are maybe a little bit. Uh, the, the idea of a pond is the right picture. Um, the water would move underground very quickly, uh -huh. so they wouldn't actually hold water for a very long time, but it would be a wet area where we could put a lot of really interesting plantings around. Um, we're hoping to put one near a school so that perhaps some of the students mm -hmm. from the school could get involved in monitoring what's going on, use it for science education. Um, we're really trying to build a partnership around these projects. Okay. Like a, maybe a little wetlands or something. Exactly. That's the right picture, a wetland. Okay. All right. So uh, to one of approval of 9C. Uh, the motion and a second to approve 9C. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The motion carries. It takes us next to 9D. This is amending uh, water service policies for the South Valley Drinking Water Project. So, Hi. Madam Chair, members <laughs> of the board, um, yes, this is a this is a request to amend the boundary of the South Valley Drinking Water Project. It just changed slightly between design and then what was completed in the final design. So we just have to amend that boundary. Okay, are there any questions about this motion item? Second. There's a motion and a second to approve 9D. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The motion carries. Thank you. We go next to other business. Mr. Stopp, this is OB 1960, Water Resources and Regular, Regulatory Compliance Update. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. I'm pleased to talk a little bit about um, Water Resources and a Regulatory Compliance Update. My goal tonight is to really talk about four things. Um, if you've heard about this concept of the law of the river, there's an overlay of federal and state regulations that kind of govern the operations for the Water Authority in terms of our permitting. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that, a little bit about how that affects our drinking water project permit. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the 100-year plan and then how the Safe Drinking Water Act and the Clean Water Act are kind of combining now where we have separate federal laws, but there's an intersection between the two that's happening and it's kind of blurring the the uh, blurring the lines between the two. Start off with a little cartoon here showing a couple of guys fighting. Um, this is kind of the way the water business is. As you guys know, sometimes you're the guy with the shovel, right? And sometimes you're the guy blocking it. But um, that's kind of the way it is in New Mexico. We're always fighting to protect our water from uh, Texas and others trying to take our water. Um, so the law of the river starts with the Rio Grande Compact. So the native waters that uh, originate in Colorado flow through Colorado, Texas, and New Mexico, and also into Mexico is a, con a compact called the Rio Grande Compact, which is really more of a contract between the states. It's ratified by Congress, uh, and we are allocated a portion of the river, and that allocation was based on uh, agriculture and ir irrig uh, irrigation uses back in the 1880s. So they divided up the flows of the river. Colorado gets the majority of the flows. We get a small piece, and then Texas gets the rest. Um, what we owe to Texas is gauged by the Otoe gauge, which is the bridge that crosses Española. If you know where you're at in Española that crosses the Rio Grande there, there is a gauge there. And the amount of water that flows past that gauge, a portion of it we get to keep, and a portion of it we deliver to Texas. There's a whole lot of other rules that go along with this, including how much we have in storage and how much we're allowed to store. But this really sets the framework for what the middle Rio Grande gets in terms of the amount of native water that flows into the stream system. We also have the underground aquifer. Uh, as you know, we've been pumping from the aquifer and we begin to reduce our pumping and now the aquifer is rising. The state engineer in 1956 developed uh, administrative guidelines for how that uh, use of that groundwater was going to be made and he was concerned about future ob obligations under the Rio Grande Compact. So he declared the basin and said that anybody that pumps water from the aquifer now has to pay the river back because the river and the aquifer are directly connected and so the river leaks when the aquifer uh, goes down and you have to pay that back. Uh, and so there's water rights administration that go along with that. Again, this is state administration. 
Then we have our San Monchama water. This is Colorado River water. Uh, we get, New Mexico gets 11.25% of the upper Colorado River Basin, which was uh, a compact that was signed between the upper basin states in 1948. Uh, we get about 650,000 acre feet of water a year. For New Mexico, the San Monchama project imports about 100,000 acre feet of that, of which we get about 48,200 acre feet. Now this is Colorado River water, so it's not governed by the Rio Grande Compact. It's imported water, and we're allowed to fully consume that water, meaning that whatever drops come in, we can fully use every single drop. So if we have some that comes out of our wastewater plant and it's not fully used, we still have a right to use that. And that really is a lot of our part of our 100-year water plan effort is to use the existing supplies we have. Uh, this is a picture of the drinking water project. It's black, though, uh, so I apologize for that. Uh -huh. Uh, but the drinking water project is governed by uh, regulations that the state engineer set on us, and it's flow-based. So we have flow-based regulations, and the flow that flows at Central Avenue, so when you drive over Central Avenue, there is also a gauge there. And the amount of water that we're allowed to divert is based on that flow that passes by uh, Central Avenue. So we are governed by the flows that are in the river in terms of our ability to divert our San Juan Chama water under the drinking water project. This is a picture of our diversion facility, if you have not been there, and also our return flows at the Rio Bravo, uh, at the Southside Water Reclamation Plant. Uh, that you can see on the upper left hand portion of it, you've got the diversion facility, you've got the fish screens, fish bypass structures. So we built the facility to protect the endangered silvery minnow. There are critical habitats for a multitude of endangered species. That also is an overlay of the federal law that which we have to operate under. Uh, in the middle Rio Grande, so we have the compacts, we have the State Administration of Groundwater, we have the Endangered Species Act, all of those form a, a relationship with what we're able to do or what we're not able to do in the river. With respect to our return flows, that's part of that declaration. We pump the aquifer, we return part of that back to the river. If you've never been to our outfall, you should go. There is a distinct difference between the water that comes out of our plant and the water that's in the river. Our water is cleaning up the river. You can see the bottom of the channel, you can see the fish, it's beautiful. We have very clean effluent going out of our plant. Uh, there was a point in time, oh, excuse me, there was a point in time when the Fish and Wildlife Service believed very strongly that our wastewater plant was one of the reasons why the silvery minnow was not thriving. So they did a series of studies where they took samples of our effluent and they took samples of the river and they compared how the fish lived, reproduced, and how long they lived and survived and it lived better in 100% effluent than it does in 100% river. So uh, the fish like our effluent better than they like the river. They live longer, they reproduce better, uh, and they survive a much longer time frame. Mr. So, Stump. Yes. Just wanted to interrupt you for a moment. You said that um, if you, when you pump, from, the requirement is that when you pump from the aquifer, there's you have to return to the river. Is that just for utilities? Because not everybody does that. So. Well, Madam Chair, when he declared the basin in 1956, there was a number of people that were already pumping. Okay. Those were grandfathered in, so to speak. Right. So any new pumping beyond that, so it, it could be an agricultural use, it could be a municipal use, although most of it is municipal uses. So you have that obligation to return that flow back to the river. Now a lot of agricultural uses, they do what they call supplemental wells. So they have a right to native water that's diverted from the river. They can pump that same amount of groundwater in terms of the depletion that's equivalent to the water rights that they own. That called a supplemental well. They don't have to pay back the river for that. But most of it's municipalities. Us, Rio Rancho, Bernalillo, the small communities south of us, they have that obligation. Okay. Is it like when you say an obligation, is that that's it's, uh, something that's regulated, it's required, it's that? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, okay. I'm sorry. Madam Chair, members of the board, every single month we turn in our state engineer's permit. Okay. We give them the exact amount of water that we pump from every single well. We give them the exact metered flow that we return at the wastewater plant. We also tell them exactly how much we divert at the river diversion, which is actually online if you ever want to see that. 24 hours a day, you can see how much we're diverting at the river and you can see how much we're returning. Um, so we give a report to the state engineer and then every single year he takes that data, he loads that into this three-dimensional groundwater flow model because every well has its own impact on the river and then he calculates how much we have to return and if we have not returned back that much, we have to supplement that return. Are there normally re we return more than we owe. What about the requirements for terms of quality for return, returning to the river? Are those requirements as well? Madam Chair and members of the board, there's no 
uh, water requirements from the state engineer in terms of the quality, but EPA does have water quality requirements for us under the Clean Water Act. So we have an MPDS permit, National Pollution Discharge Elimination System uh -huh. permit from EPA. They have specific guidelines what water quality we're supposed to meet. And that is part of the discussion we're going to have tonight. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Ryle. Question, uh, do, do you get audited by the state engineer on your, whatever you send to them, or, or how do they keep up with what? I guess I'm asking, do they believe what you say, or do they actually audit you to find out what you're doing is correct? Madam Chair and uh, Trustee Ryle, well, they never believe anything we say. Um, <laughs> Everybody has their eye on us. We're the most heavily regulated entity in the Middle Valley. Um, they regularly come inspect our meters. They will make us calibrate our meters. We turn in a calibration report on our meters every single year. They'll come and read those meters. They'll compare those meter readings to what we submitted to them in the reports. So they're constantly checking on us, believe me. Um, the requirements that we have for 15-minute uh, data to be posted online are the state engineer's requirements. Uh, but yeah, they, they don't, I mean, they trust us, obviously, but they, they actually verify quite a sure. bit, a lot more than most people do. Trust and verify. Oh. Correct. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. So this next picture shows that kind of relationship with the, on the river. This is the river itself uh, through Albuquerque. We have our diversion of our uh, uh, water up at Alameda. We have the Central Avenue gauge there in the middle of the slide, and then we have our return flow at the bottom. So that's the South Side Water Reclamation return flow. So there's 15 miles of difference between where we divert the water and where we return the water, and the state engineer pays attention to the gauge data at, at Central Avenue. But that gauge data is also very important as it relates to our MPDS permit that I talked about before. So this gives a kind of a picture of the overlay of how things can change in the river and how the water authority's permits are affected by those, those changes of flow. Um, Carlos Bustos, our conservation officer, is going to talk a little bit about uh, water use uh, this month. But you can see water use continues to go down. Um, it's incredible to see the amount of uh, uh, how much we've changed our usage over the years. Uh, and we continue to increase our surface water use. And we're on average between uh, 60 and 80 percent of surface water used. Um, and so you can see how we started in 2008, about 11 years ago, kind of slowly implementing the system. And you can see how much change in the blue versus the green over time. So our pumping is significantly reduced. Because we reduce our pumping, we have less obligation on the river. The aquifer continues to rise. These are the latest USGS gauges. These are 2018. Uh, data, and I just picked three different points, but you can see that in 2008 when we started diverting river water, the aquifer began to rebound. It's rebounded 30, 40, some pla places as high as 60 feet, uh, and we're going to continue to see that rise, and we'll talk about our groundwater management program uh, at some point when that rise stops and it starts to come down again. We'll have a groundwater management plan in place to, to deal with that. So just reviewing the 100-year plan, if you guys remember in 2016, we went through two years of this process to evaluate how much demand we thought we were going to have in the future, what our supply obligations are, and how much our supply could be uh, reduced from uh, surface water reductions due to climate change. And we compared those, and we just determined what the gaps were. And then we came up with a plan, a series of policies and projects to meet our demand over the next 100 years, primarily using the existing supplies we have. As so we talk about conservation going down to 110 gallons per capita per day over the next 20 years, I think reuse is a big part of where we're headed. Reusing that effluent that we talked about before, if we, as we reduce our pumping, we'll have more of that effluent available for us to use, and that's going to be a big part of our future. Uh, storing that water, whether it's in the aquifer or storing it in above-ground storage, uh, transitioning to use of storm water, and then indirect or direct potable reuse, that is our wastewater turned into a drinking water source. Uh, and then you have watershed management, of course, to protect our supplies upstream in, in the uh, watersheds. It's so a groundwater management plan. As I said, the groundwater is continuing to increase. The aquifer is continuing to rise. That's sort of the orange line that's dotted. It's going to rise, and it's going to get to a, a spot. We don't know exactly what that is going to be, and then it's going to start to go down. And so the whole point of our groundwater management plan is rather to go look back what happened in the 90s when the aquifer was dropping about three feet a year, and there was not a lot to do at that point. Now it's rising, and so now we know how we need to deal with it. We need to reduce our groundwater use over time so that we can continue to manage that aquifer at that level. So we're going to add projects and more reuse over a period of time to reduce our use on groundwater and save that groundwater for the future.
So that's really the, the point to the groundwater management plan. Uh, okay, this is the intersection of the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act. A lot of the regulatory boundaries are, are blurring. Uh, I'll give you a few examples of that. Arsenic is a perfect example. In the late eight, 1980s, um, Cong uh, Congress recognized tribal entities as state entities, allowed them to set their own water quality standards. The Pueblo has let us set an arsenic standard that was going to require that we treat our, our arsenic going out of our wastewater plant. Um, we, uh, back when we were the city, we challenged that. We sued them in federal court. Um, we lost very badly. Um, Congress made that rule, and they were, EPA was enforcing that rule. So we are uh, responsible for meeting the Pueblo of his lead of water quality standards. Um, and that rulemaking changed when the drinking water standard changed from 50 parts per million to 10. So once the drinking water standard changed to 10, now the effluent coming out of our plant is usually below three micrograms per liter. So we had an implementation of a clean water act, or a safe drinking water act rule that actually helped us on the clean water side. In terms of phosphorus, we add a phosphorus blend at our wastewater treatment plant. Um, just to kind of look at what that looks like. The green line shows the amount of phosphorus coming into our wastewater plant, but we add phosphorus on the surface water side for corrosion control and for our pH control coming out of the water plant. And then you can see the effluent is, uh, the amount of phosphorus coming into our wastewater plant is the green and the amount coming out is the purple. Well, EPA on our last draft permit said that we're going to have to start monitoring phosphorus. They're worried about potential nutrient going into the stream system. We already remove ammonia. Now they're looking at phosphorus. So we're adding phosphorus into our system for corrosion control on the drinking water side. And here we are potentially going to be affected by the Clean Water Act on the wastewater side. Again, the, the two different uh, federal regulations are sort of coming together. This is a picture of our wastewater flows. I already talked about that. Over time, we're going to reduce our groundwater pumping, so we'll have more wastewater available. And that wastewater is planned to be used for either direct or indirect potable reuse. So that is, we're turning a wastewater supply into a drinking water supply. And so that's a complete transition from the Clean Water Act to the Safe Drinking Water Act. And that's a big part of where we're headed with Water 2120. And New Mexico currently has no regulations related to the use of indirect potable reuse or direct potable reuse. California and a whole bunch of other states are working on implementing regulations. So what is the quality of the water that's going to be required? What's the treatment processes that are going to have to go through? And New Mexico does not have any standards. So as we move closer and closer to doing that, which as we know in our plan is decades away, uh, we still are going to need to work with the state of New Mexico to develop those regulations because clearly we want the public perception. We're worried about that. We have dis distribution system I issues as we blend all these various qualities of water, whether it's surface water, groundwater, or indirect potable reuse. We've got to worry about chemical compatibility. Uh, and then there's a discussion about national standards going on about IPDR and DPR, but most people don't want that. Most people want the states uh, to keep their own regulatory basis. So going back to the flow in the river, this is kind of the issue that I was talking about before with our Clean Water Act. EPA recently in our permit looked at the flow at Central Avenue gauge and decided that they picked a 20-year period, they picked a one-day critical low flow in 2013, and they set our permit limits based on one arbitrary day in 2013. If you looked back about what happened on 2013, the MRGCD changed their diversion rates at Angostura, which is about 15 miles north of Albuquerque. They diverted a significant quantity of water, routed around Albuquerque to in the drains to keep it out of the river so we had less evaporation. And here we had low flows in the river of which came back, EPA came back and said, oh, by the way, that we're going to use that low flow to set your standards for the future. So there's an operational issue that goes with how the river operates associated with our Clean Water Act. We clearly don't like the way that EPA did that. It was very arbitrary. Uh, and so we, we've been in discussions with them. We do not have a permit from them yet, but we're waiting to see what the results of our comments were. That low flow was 53 CFS. So if you look at the amount of load that we're going to be allowed to put into the river that based on a 53 CFS means that our concentrations are going to go way down in the future. So it is a big issue for us to be looking at in terms of what can happen. But MRGCD sometimes controls the river and sometimes they decide on their own what they're going to do and there's ramifications for us. That 53 CFS would have limited our ability and we would have had to shut down the drinking water plant as a result of that. 
So that was a lot of information, and I did a lot of talking, and I'll be glad to answer any questions that you have, Madam Chair and members of the board. That was a lot of information. <laughs> uh, but it's interesting. Um, does anyone have any questions? Councilor Sun. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I have one question regarding the 100-year plan that was implemented three years ago. I mean, now we are in year three of the 100-year plan. I mean, how are we forecasting and where are we at with this plan? Because, I mean, that's a long-term plan. I, I was kind of hesitant to support it when I did, but I said I think that's real visionary by the policy board and by the staff. Well, uh, so far the implementation is going well. Uh, Carlos will be up next to talk about our water usage. Our goal was to reduce our use one GPCD per year. Well, we're way, way ahead of that. Uh, in terms of our reuse, we're working on these projects to start to re implement reuse. Catherine was up here early that talked about aquifer storage and recovery. So all of these pieces and parts are going together. The beauty of where we're at right now is because of our conservation and because of what we've done, we're good. We have a long-term time frame where we're still okay. So we have some time to work and implement these plans. Watch as things change, come back to you, see if there's policy changes that we need to make. Um, but we're, we're right on target and we're doing really, really well in terms of our water use. We're doing well in terms of our groundwater, surface water use. Um, so things are going well. Are there any other questions? Thank you very, very much, Mr. Stump. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Okay, we have another presentation. This is the Drought and Precipitation Probability Report. And that's Carlos Bustos. Mr. Bustos. You're going to tell us about all the rain we're going to get. <laughs> <laughs> hey, good afternoon, Madam Chair, uh, members of the board. I'm Carlos Bustos, and I manage the conservation program. Um, so we're not in a drought. It's great. Uh, we're actually doing pretty good. And, and customer demand is, is about 812 million gallons uh, less than uh, last year by this time. So water usage, we're looking at probably four EPCD drop this year, which as John alluded, our goal was to uh, keep that at one EPCD. And uh, nevertheless, uh, the efforts that we're doing and, and, and how the customers are responding uh, to weather events in this particular year is, is, is surprising, but also expected based on the history of how customers respond to weather in, in Albuquerque. The next three months, a uh, precipitation uh, outlook is, is promising. Uh, September already, uh, there's certain areas that got uh, almost close to an inch, which is about the average uh, for, for this time of year. Uh, the precipitation is about the same uh, compared to 2018. The difference is that we got most of the precipitation in 2019 during the spring, and then August was pretty dry. Uh, end of July was semi-dry, so that monsoon, uh, it was a uh, little bit spotty in, in Albuquerque. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the regards to inches, it's about the same, and the fall season is looking pretty good. So what we're recommending is to go ahead and plant a tree, use some water uh, the next couple months. Uh, trees need watering, so take care of your landscapes and make sure that uh, you get them strong as we move into uh, the winter season. Uh, Mr. Bustos, are we uh, still expecting, well, I, I think I'd heard this, that the monsoons were basically uh, coming, but they're late. Is that true? Or, because, I mean, we didn't really. The, they were kind of spotty. There were certainly some areas in Albuquerque that experienced the monsoon uh, normally, uh, uh -huh. but there were certainly some, some areas that uh, it was uh, drier than uh, other past monsoon seasons. Okay. Yeah, I, I could see that some areas were getting yes. a lot of water and, and yeah. our area wasn't. So. Yep. Uh, okay, well, in that's regards to uh, outdoor and landscape, uh, the, the temperature has dropped almost uh, 12 degrees in the last three weeks. So yes, we something. probably all noticed that. Uh, it's still expected that it's going to be in the 80s the next month or so. Uh, but it, it's definitely dropping. So as we get cooler nights, evaporation is less. So... Uh, Actual water usage start continually uh, keeps going down. Okay. Are there any other comments or questions for Mr. Bustos? Thank you very much. Thank you. So that uh, ends our business. And um, oh, sorry.
Commissioner Kassar. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Before we close today, I'd like to uh, thank uh, uh, Mark Sanchez for lunch uh, this afternoon. Um, he had a really great uh, picnic with his employees uh, right there by the water treatment plant. And I just wanted to uh, shout out to all the employees who work for the Water Utility Authority. Uh, we think you're champions. Uh, we think you do a great, great job. It was great to see all of you at a picnic together from the guys who dig the tunnels and dig the ditches and lay the pipe to the people who, uh, you know, monitor the water and, and, and make sure that everything uh, is uh, uh, you know, within uh, the standards. Uh, they were all there, and uh, it was just great to see all those people. They, they work very efficiently, and, uh, you know, we didn't do a lot of awards today like, like we normally do, and so I just wanted to make sure that uh, we did a good uh, shout-out and thank uh, Mark Sanchez for a, a, a really, really great job at the Water Authority because you have some really happy employees uh, that like to work for you, and uh, you know that's rare, uh, to be honest <laughs> with you. So congratulations and thanks again. Yeah, I have to add my thanks too. It was a really nice day. Really enjoyed it out there. Good food, good company. And I want to add my thanks too to all the employees as well. And I know that Councillor Sanchez, you were there for a little while. It's a great. I was also there, and uh, the employees seemed very happy. <laughs> but it was great to see the chemists, the engineers. Uh, the blue collar workers all working in collaboration, just being there at an event to celebrate the work that you guys do each and every day for the citizens of Albuquerque. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned.